This is Optimal Relationships Daily, episode 1623. Why is it hard to talk about feelings? Part 1 by Keith Wilson of KeithWilsonCounseling.com. Hello, everybody, and happy Saturday. I'm your host and narrator, Greg Audino. Very excited to begin this two parter with you today, courtesy of Keith Wilson. I'm always pumping Keith's tires. I really like his writing a lot. And this article I find to be one of his best blends of importance, clarity, and I'd say also user friendliness. So let's jump into part one as we optimize your life. Why is it hard to talk about feelings? Part one by Keith Wilson of KeithWilsonCounseling.com. You don't have to be hyper-rational or repressed to have a hard time talking about feelings. You could be emotionally intelligent and still have difficulty. Feelings are hard to talk about. There are simpler reasons and deeper, more complex reasons. The simple ones first. You want to avoid conflict. You just want to have a nice time. So even if Indian food gives you indigestion, you'll go for Vindaloo because that's what your friend wants to do. It's not that she'll be terribly disappointed if you say you feel like a burger. It's that you'll have to discuss it when you'd rather just eat. Some feelings are ugly. Anger, envy, jealousy, hatred, terror. Some feelings are so hideous that you'd rather they never saw the light of day. You may feel it's better to keep them to yourself than inflict them on anyone. You have a fear of rejection. If you believe disclosing your feelings to those you care about would result in their rejection of you, it's no wonder you have a hard time talking about feelings. You'd rather swallow your feelings than take the chance of making anyone mad at you. You're behaving passive-aggressively. When you pout, stonewall, or hold your hurt feelings inside, instead of disclosing what you feel, you could be trying to punish people by weaponizing your silence. It's hopeless. If you're convinced that your relationship can't improve no matter what you do, you won't talk about your feelings. What's the use? You have low self-esteem. If you believe that you are not entitled to express your feelings because you have nothing worth saying, guess what? You won't say a peep. You believe feelings must be present for you to talk about them. A lot of people believe that unless they are completely possessed by a feeling, that they are faking it when they talk about it. They have to be enraged to talk about their anger, for instance. If they try to talk about anger when they are not angry, it seems manipulative. You want others to read your mind. If you believe that others should already know how you feel, you would have no reason to talk about it. If you have to tell your husband that you love it when he brings flowers, it won't count when he brings them. You'd rather be a martyr. It's more heroic to be unfulfilled, unrequited, and unreciprocated than to have your needs met. You'd rather just solve the problem than talk about it. It feels like whining to talk about your feelings. And you'd rather just solve the problem than talk about it. It feels like whining to talk about your feelings. Those are the simple reasons it's hard to talk about feelings. What's the deeper reason? Well, feelings are practically impossible to talk about. Let's look at how a feeling is made. Before a feeling can be shared, it has to pass through three facilities that extract the raw material, assemble it, and distribute it to the world. The first facility extracts the raw material. In the beginning, there was the feeling as it is before you compared it to anything or had words to describe it. At this point, the feeling is a combination of a body sensation and a social situation, but before words and comparison. You can't even call it a feeling at this point, it's just a sensation. But, since both feeling and sensation are words, it's hard to talk about this at all. That's why you move through the other two facilities. In the next facility, you compare this instance with others that you've experienced before. Making that comparison forms it into a feeling as experienced by you. Where and when did this happen before? What happened next? This is all still before words, remember. It's pure association, like deja vu. Words help, so you move it on through the third facility, where you start to put words to it. Words that other people know so that you can communicate with them. You call this a feeling, and then you identify what you are feeling. The feeling is now ready for distribution. You could decide not to say anything at all because of the simple reasons people don't talk about their feelings. Or you could verbalize your feelings. You might say, for instance, You just stepped on my toe, you jerk. It hurts, and I'm angry. Congratulations! You have just succeeded in talking about your feelings. What was so hard about that? Aside from the fact that you might have just started a fight, you performed three very complicated operations. 
you took a raw experience, made it into a personal experience, and then packaged it for others. It started with your nerves firing a signal from your toe to your brain. There was some pressure on your foot, and someone was close enough to put it there. You shipped these raw experiences off to the next facility where you put things together. In the second facility, you decide those two data points. The pain in your toe and something nearby belong together. You decide the pressure on your foot was from a guy. You remember other guys stepping on your toes years ago in the schoolyard of your youth. They were bullies who used to get things started this way. You learned that it was best to stand up to them, so, by golly, you decided you're going to stand up this time and not be pushed around. Voila. You just made a raw experience personal. Before you ever said a word, the third facility, in charge of distribution, had already gotten started, putting labels on things. The guy, because of his association with the bullies of your youth, became a jerk, the feeling that you got from your toe was hurt, and your decision to stand up to bullies was called being angry. Taking a raw experience, making it personal, and deciding how and if you would communicate it to others all happens unconsciously, that is to say automatically, without any deliberate involvement on your part. The advantage of unconscious processing is that you get your final product quickly. The disadvantages are the mistakes you make and your inability to know just what you were thinking. A feeling happens very quickly, but when you're talking about your feelings, going painstakingly backwards through this process, it's excruciatingly slow. It's not only hard, it may well be impossible. Few people have trouble proclaiming their feelings as long as it's safe to do so, but talking about feelings is different from declaring them. To talk about them, you have to be able to pull them apart and see how they're made. It's not enough to say that the guy is a jerk, your toe hurts, and you're angry. If you're going to talk about your feelings, you're going to be asked how you came to those conclusions and what it all means to you. It's like your teacher said in math class, show your work. It's not enough in math class to have the right answer. You need to be able to demonstrate how you arrived at the answer. Knowing the process is more important than knowing the answer. You can always arrive at the right answer accidentally, but if your process is erroneous, you're in big trouble. To be continued. You just listened to part one of the post titled, Why Is It Hard to Talk About Feelings? by Keith Wilson of KeithWilsonCounseling.com. Love this one. Loving this one so much. A wonderful start from Keith here as he forces us to confront not only the complexity, but the importance of feelings and the expression of them. And I think what I'm enjoying the most about this post so far is how well it can educate us on both ourselves and others. As Keith mentions, talking about feelings is a hard thing to do. And because of that, whether it pertains to us or someone else, there can be a lot of anger or judgment or you know, frustration that comes up when it's not being done the right way. And when we're clouded by these feelings, it can be so hard to think honestly and empathetically about how to get to the root of the problem. Basically what Keith said, how can we understand how we came to the conclusions about our own anger, for example, but in this case, anger about feelings not being talked about? It's getting meta here. So an article that helps us to dispel those difficult feelings and consider other perspectives about where this inability to express ourselves comes from, and uh, we're better positioned to develop compassion and patience, which only aids the expression of feelings. And to think there's still more tomorrow. <laughs> Time to wrap up part one, everybody. But I really hope that you're enjoying this post so far as much as I am. I'm such a fan of Keith's work. So be sure to be here again tomorrow for part two, where we will finish up this article and where your optimal life awaits.